Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Great Vic. If you're, uh, this is your church home or you're just visiting with us this morning, I trust you'll feel very warmly welcomed among us. A word of welcome also to those joining us at home still via the live stream. Uh, we want you to know uh, that we know you're there uh, and we trust that we will be able to worship together in one spirit, blessed this morning, wherever we are, coming into the presence of the Lord. Happy Mother's Day to all you mums out there. I know this can be a day of thankfulness for some. It can be a day with some mixed feelings for others, mingled with sorrow perhaps as we remember mothers no longer with us. But whatever this day stokes in your heart, we all come together to the Lord to acknowledge Him uh, as the one who meets all of our needs and who comforts us and is the joy of our rejoicing. Now this evening at 7 p.m. on our YouTube channel, we're going to have a new little series of devotions beginning uh, that I'm calling Wisdom Along the Way. We're going to be just dipping into the book of Proverbs over the next number of Sunday evenings. And uh, tonight, a little bit of an intro to the book. So 7 o'clock on our YouTube channel. If you're able to tune in, do uh, pick that up. And we'll just be thinking over the next number of Sunday evenings of individual Proverbs, little snippets of wisdom that guide us along uh, our way in life. Then on Wednesday evening, we're going to have our midweek on Zoom. We're still meeting on Zoom uh, for our midweek prayer time. Hopefully, we'll be able to gather together in the building soon. Uh, we'll be looking at that in due course. But for now, we're continuing on uh, Zoom at 7.45. And I know it's hard and I know it's challenging to pray o over Zoom. Um, but let's try to keep going with it if we can. Uh, it's important for us to be together as a family in prayer. Now, we are here to worship the living God. And I never like to just say that and pass over it lightly. What a privilege to be together to worship God. This is life for us, the people of God. In Hebrews chapter 1, we read these wonderful words about the glory and person of Jesus Christ. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are here before you, the fountain of life, and we ask that you would just pour over us your wonderful love and grace, meet us where we are, and refresh us together in your presence, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we sing, Only a Holy God.
together and just take a moment to be still. Remember that we're coming into the presence of the holy, the holy God. Our Father, our God, we come into your presence this morning and we just want to thank you for the privilege that's ours, that in Jesus Christ we can approach you, the fountain of life, the fountain of joy, the fountain of peace, the source of all that is good, that is lovely, that is pure, that is whole. We can come to you, Father, and find in you the refreshment and life we need. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We bow in reverence before you, the creator and sustainer of the heavens and the earth, the one who holds in his hand our next breath. We steady ourselves before you and ask that you would show us your holiness and help us to appreciate your splendor and majesty. Lord, we come and as your brightness shines on our finiteness and smallness, Lord, we, we become conscious of our smallness, of our, how fragile we are, we become conscious of our sin. And as we come to you, our God, we confess our sins and we say we're sorry. We are sorry, Lord, for the thoughts, the words that have displeased you this week, for the things we, we've done that have demonstrated a lack of appreciation for your nearness in our lives. When we've pushed you to the margins and relegated you to the sidelines, busying ourselves with lots of other things, Lord, we want to say we're sorry. In you, we live and move and have our being. And we want you to be at the center of our lives, the center on the throne in our hearts. We want you to be Lord of all of our lives. And Lord, as we reflect on our sin and lament over it, we want to again feel the, the sheer relief and joy we have in what we have in Jesus. For your son 
He entered this world and he bore our sin in himself. And he paid our debt through his death on the cross. And because he died and rose again, our old sinful self has died and we are risen up and we have new life in him so that we can join the hymn writer and say, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. It's nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Lord, how amazing that we can come into your presence this morning and know that we don't bear sin, we don't carry sin. Our sin's gone as far as the east is from the west. So we don't have to car in guilt and shame. But Father, as a father, you invite us to run into your arms and to be embraced in your love. And Lord, in you is everything we need. Every longing is satisfied in you. Lord, we may have a taste of it in this world, but we know, Lord, so much more is to come when we are with you in the new heavens and new earth. Lord, we thank you for all your goodness to us. In Jesus, your Son, there dwells a treasure all divine, and your matchless grace has made that treasure mine. Oh, Lord, we thank you for all we have in Jesus. And we thank you for your goodness to us this week, expressed in so many ways. And we just thank you even for the goodness of being able to worship you this morning. And Lord, we remember today that it is Mother's Day, and we want to give you thanks for our mothers and for the sacrificial love and care that is involved in faithful motherhood. For those who are mothers or grandmothers, I pray you'd help them to be wise and loving in their parenting, patient gracious, dependent on you. For those who are sons or daughters, may they love and, and support and make space for their mothers in appropriate ways. And Father, we know that we conduct all of our relationships in a fallen world, and this can impact even our closest relationships. And Lord, for relationships between mother and sons or daughters that are strained, again, I just pray this morning for healing and for reconciliation and for peace. And for those who have lost their mothers or for those who never really knew the love of a mother, we give thanks to you that though mothers come and go, your loving care for us in Christ never passes away. We also remember those who perhaps would love to have been a mother but were not able to for whatever reason. Help them again to see that your way is perfect and that you can satisfy more than anything in this world. Lord, we continue to pray for ourselves in these days of the pandemic where there's so much around us that can tempt our hearts to fear or despair or anxiety. We come to you, the one who can comfort us however we're feeling this morning. Father, we pray continually for our government and pray that you'd give them wisdom to lead us well in these days. Help us to be good citizens, balancing love and respect for those in authority over us and balancing also the need to keep our eyes on you and ultimately find our hope in you. Lord, we do just look to you, however we're feeling, or whatever's in our hearts this morning, we come to you as the fountain the one who says to us, fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And we look to you for this stabilizing grace this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, please turn with me to Mark's Gospel. We're continuing this morning our journey through this gospel. Now we come to Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41. This amazing account in the life of Jesus where he calms a storm. There's so much for us here this morning. And I've been so eager for us to be in this passage together. So let's, as always, pay really close attention as we read God's word. On that day, when evening had come, 
he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. And the other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of the Lord. Well, something we seek to practice here at Great Vic is meaningful membership. Becoming a member of this church is a bringing yourself under the formal care and oversight of the church family. Becoming a church member means you're committing to live your Christian life out under the care and with love for a local group of believers. Church membership says, I recognize that I share responsibility for the lives of other believers, and I need other believers to help me grow as a Christian. Church membership is commitment to a local body for your growth and so that you can serve the growth in that body. And we're delighted uh, that recently Charlotte McCready has settled with us here at Great Vic. She's gone through the membership application process, and we're at the point of welcoming her into membership this morning. So Charlotte, are you out there somewhere? There you are. If I can invite you to just come up for a wee moment. Uh, There's a mic here uh, for you on the floor. You can take that and then just join me on the stage. We like to take the opportunity when we're welcoming in a new member just to hear a little bit about who they are and a bit about how they came to know the Lord. So Charlotte, do you mind telling us a bit about who you are, where you're from, what you do, and how you came to know the Lord? Um, So I'm originally from Lurgan, and when I was about 12, I moved with my family to Tobermore, um, and now I live in Belfast uh, while I study. Yeah, and what do you study? Because this Um, is interesting. (laughs) (laughs) So I graduated um, from my undergraduate degree last June in theology and history, and now I'm studying for a master's. Um, It's a strange one. It's uh, violence, terrorism, and security. Um, Violence, so terrorism, <laughs> and security. And if you, when you get to know Charlotte, you'll realize she's a very gentle soul, so it's, <laughs> it's an interesting one. So if we want to know anything about that, we'll be coming to you, Charlotte. <laughs> Can you just share with us how you came to know the Lord then? Yeah. Um, so I didn't grow up in a Christian household, um, but I was still sent to GB and Sunday school and Bible um, holiday clubs and things like that. Um, so it was in Sunday school where I was saved, and my teacher was talking about how we put our faith Um, and our trust in all these earthly things every day, Um, but how much more trust that we can have in the God of the universe. And so it was then that the Lord opened my eyes to my sin and that I needed a savior. Um, And so from then, when I was about seven, I put my trust in the Lord. And as I grew, I realized that this was the amazing grace of God, that he would choose to save me, um, a sinner that he would choose to adopt me um, through the blood of Jesus. Um, so when we moved to Tobermore, um, we started going to Tobermore Baptist Church, and I was baptized at 17. Um, and then from then on, as I've continued to grow my faith, I've just been learning to, to trust in the Lord for everything and placing my hope in Him. Yeah, so, wonderful. Yeah. Thanks, Charlotte, so much for sharing that with us. Now, it's been a challenge, I know, to try and get to know the church family here in the midst of a pandemic. <laughs> and even from your membership interview to now, it's been quite a journey. But we're so delighted to be welcoming you in this morning. Usually, as you know, I shake someone's hand to formally welcome them into the church. We can't do that, so I'll give you the elbow bump of a welcome into our church family. And let's just pray for Charlotte as uh, we commit her to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the joy of seeing Uh, your work progress here, even in the midst of these strange circumstances we're in. 
But we thank you, Lord, that you have uh, worked in Charlotte's life. You've transformed her by your grace. Uh, you've saved her, and you've, you've led her now to come and, and find a home here at Great Vic. And Lord, as she continues to study her masters and settle here in Belfast, as she serves and worships with us here as part of the church family at Great Vic, we pray that you would just encourage her, that she would be nourished, built up in her faith here. She would grow in the grace and knowledge of her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray that we too as a family would be enriched and blessed by her presence among us. Lord, we're in this together, and we thank you for Charlotte's welcome into the church family today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can take the mic down with you, and then we'll get that at the end. Thanks, Charlotte. Well, we're going to continue now as we stand to sing this lovely prayer as we approach God's word. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you. seats. Kids and young people, you can make your way out to your classes now. I uh, hope you have a good time together and uh, learn loads. Uh, thanks to Stephen and Anna just for leading us this morning. Um, we're going to uh, turn now to God's Word, so please do open with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 35. And as you turn and find your place there, let me just pray and ask for God's help as we come to study His Word.
Father, we look to you to grant us the help we need through your Holy Spirit that we might see what you want us to see here. Give us ears to hear you speaking. Stir our hearts with a vision of the true glory of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And together in this moment, help us to concentrate and to learn and grow. Do a powerful work of your grace in our hearts and in our lives this morning. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, earlier this week, I stumbled upon an article in the British Medical Journal of General Practice. I don't usually read this journal, um, but I found it as I was doing some uh, initial research and study for this sermon. And I stumbled across an article in that journal entitled, Treating the Pandemic of Fear. And that caught my attention. And in the article, Dr. Samar Razak was highlighting the fact that the rapid spread of COVID-19 has brought with it not only physical trauma, but an unprecedented wave of psychological debility. He goes on to say that unhelpful death toll reports, careless reporting, and unbridled social media messages have caused fear to spread at a transmission rate far superior to that of the virus. Without doubt, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought along with it a bigger and perhaps uglier sister, a pandemic of fear. There is so much out there at the moment that is creating fear. Could I catch this virus and die a horrible death? Even if you're younger and you don't feel as vulnerable, you might be wondering, could I get long COVID and be sick for a long time? That might make you afraid. What will the knock-on effects of all this be? How will our economy fare? How do we pay back the debt? There is so much fear anxiety, and uncertainty about our future. And in light of this reality and this context that we're living in, the passage we come to this morning of Jesus stilling the storm, it has so much to teach us about the difference Jesus should make to our lives when we're surrounded by things that can make us afraid. If I was to summarize the main message of this uh, account in Jesus' ministry in a nutshell, it would be like this. When Jesus is in your boat, you don't have to fear what everyone else fears. I've called this series through Mark's gospel, Seeing Jesus to be Shaped by Jesus. And in this passage, we're going to see how Seeing or holding a right appreciation of Jesus' identity should shape how we as Christians face things that can cause our hearts to fear. Seeing who Jesus is should have an impact on how we think about fear when it's all around us. As Christians, how should we live when there's so much fear around us? How are we called to be different? How can we be salt and light in a culture gripped by fear? This passage is given to challenge us to be a people who are marked by faith, not fear. So, roadmap for where we're going this morning. I'm going to walk down through the account of Jesus' powerful miracle, this stilling of the storm. And we're going to organize our sort of walk through under three headings, three great things that happen in the narrative, in the account. I wonder, did you notice that? Three occurrences of the word great in the text. It's interesting, verse 37, the great windstorm. Um, we're going to think of the fear that accompanied it. Then verse 39, we're going to think of the great calm. 
and how it came about. And then verse 41, the great fear and why it was warranted. So I'm going to walk down through the text, and then I'm just going to, for the rest, the second half, the back end of the message, we're just going to draw out three lessons. When you see this account of this powerful miracle, we're going to just draw out three lessons. Here's what we're to take from it. Here's how this should shape our thinking about Jesus and our thinking about fear as Christians. And I hope that this will be particularly helpful for you this week and going forward as you engage with the fear-soaked culture that we're all living in. So, let's enter right into the text in verse 35. We're told that after the day of teaching the crowds from the boat on the Sea of Galilee, you remember that last time, the crowds were so pressed around Jesus, he had to get in a boat, just push off a little into the Sea of Galilee so that all the crowds could gather around and hear him. Well, after that day of teaching, we read, when it was evening, Jesus said, let's go across to the other side. Now, he's sitting on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee near Capernaum. He wants to go somewhere on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is about 13 miles from top to bottom, about eight miles from one side to the other at its widest point. So this is no small jaunt across a wee pond. This is potentially a significant journey. In verse 36, we read that they left the crowd there on the shore and they headed off together in the boat, taking Jesus, the disciples, taking Jesus along with them just as he was. I think that little phrase is there just to tell us that they didn't go back to the shore to fetch any belongings. They just press on to the next region to continue the work of proclaiming the kingdom of God. Something humbling about that, I think, or something beautiful about the simplicity of Jesus. If we're going on a journey, you know, we pack our suitcases, we think, I'll need this, I'll need this, I'll need this, but Jesus is there in the boat teaching, let's go to the other side, okay, we'll go. Well, they embark on the journey, and in verse 37, we read about this great windstorm that sweeps over the lake, comes out of nowhere, and makes conditions very treacherous. Now, you've probably heard this before, the Sea of Galilee is notorious for such sudden squalls that come up upon it. They can arrive in a totally unexpected manner. I'm a big fan of Jeff Maskell, the BBC weatherman. Now, I like Barabas too. They're all great, but they would be able to tell us more about this than perhaps we could understand. But it's actually a perfect uh, concoction where the Sea of Galilee is versus its surrounding for storms like these. For example, the Sea of Galilee is 700 feet below sea level. Up to the north, about 30 miles north, you've got this range of mountains. You've got Mount Hermon that rises 9,300 feet above sea level. The cool air of the mountains comes down and meets the warm air rising off the lake. And when they crash into each other, they create these sudden storms that howl through the valleys and land on the Sea of Galilee with great aggression. And so this is what happens. Jesus and the disciples are in the boat in the middle of such a storm, and it was clearly a terrifying experience. Now, we have to realize this boat wasn't like a Steneline, wasn't like the Costa Concordia or a big cruise ship or something like that, and that's maybe not the best comparison, but this is a small boat. This would have been about eight meters long, wooden, two and a half meters wide, one and a half meters kind of tall. This was a fairly small boat. You could squeeze uh, space for about 15 people in it. You would have four rowers, a simple sail for when the wind was with you. And they're right there in the middle of the Sea of Galilee in a huge storm. And in verse 37, we go on to read that waves were breaking into the boat. The boat was taking on water. These were seasoned fishermen, some of them, but they knew this, this is bad. This is really, really bad. Now, how would you feel if you were there? That would be terrifying. No life jackets or anything like that. You're in the middle of a sea in a big storm, and the waves are entering the boat. It's no surprise that in verse 40 we read that the disciples were afraid. Jesus later speaks to them, why are you so afraid? But they were filled with fear. 
Well, from that panic-stricken scene in verse 38, the attention turns to Jesus. And what do we read about him? We read that he was asleep in the stern on a cushion. Now, some of these boats were known to have had a raised platform in the back of them that would have space for cushions and blankets, maybe a little bit of shelter where those who were weary could sit, lie down, and rest. And here we're told Jesus is sleeping. Now, what's interesting is this is the only time in all of the Gospels where you read of Jesus sleeping. And that, I think, is to get our attention. You're to stop for a moment and think, wow, the only time I read of Jesus sleeping in all of the Gospels is in the middle of a big storm. I wonder if that's supposed to teach us anything. There's a whole lot of things we could meditate on and ponder. I think probably two things are supposed to catch our eye at least. One, I think we're to see simply the humanity of Jesus. He's tired from a day's teaching. You can imagine as the journey would have begun, the nice rocking of a ship would have rocked him over to sleep. And now that the storm's picking up, he's in a deep sleep and he hasn't woken up yet. He's tired and he needs to rest. See the humanity of Jesus. This was a man. Second, though, I think we're probably to see a picture of complete trust and rest in the Father. The only time we read of him sleeping in the storm, it's in a storm. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think there's this beautiful picture of just utter confidence and rest in his Father. The kind of rest that we're invited to find. Well, we know that the disciples are not experiencing such rest. In fact, they're exasperated over the fact that Jesus is asleep. And reminiscent of the Old Testament story of Jonah, the disciples come to him and shake Jesus awake and say, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? They, that, that is the, the response of panic. Lord, do you not care? We're going to drown. We're dying here. And how does Jesus respond? Well, in divine humility. He chooses not to respond to their rebuke, but he lets his actions speak louder than his words. In verse 39, we read that Jesus awoke, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. So from the great storm to the great calm. This was a calm that was tangible. With the same authoritative words that Jesus used to cast out and silence the demons, Jesus commands the forces of nature that no man can control. And when he says, quiet to the wind and to the sea, it's like a master saying, sit to their dog. And the dog just sits. The master speaks. And all creation knows the master's voice and obeys. And this is a powerful miracle for, for a couple of levels. And you think about it. You know, you can stop. One might see wind just stop in a moment. But if the wind has been churning up the sea and the waters... It can take days for the tide to settle. The wind maybe could have stopped coincidentally just at the same time Jesus spoke those words, but there's no way the sea could suddenly just be still. Jesus, with a word, presses a calmness down on the water that no one can control. And in the midst of that great calm, in verse 40, Jesus breaks the silence with these penetrating words. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Oh, imagine if you were sitting there as one of the disciples in the boat. The calm that was so quiet it almost screamed. <laughs> And yet, in that silence, just one voice. Why are you so afraid? 
Maybe that's what Jesus wants to speak to you this morning. Well, how would you just expect the disciples to react in that moment? You sort of imagine they'd be jubilant or relieved at least, wouldn't you? They, they might sort of think, oh, well, yes, we should have trusted him all along, but we were going to die and we're safe. You'd expect them to be rejoicing, but notice that is not how they respond. The account ends with the third great thing we read of in the narrative. We read in verse 41, they were filled with great fear. When they were afraid of the storm, we read that they were only afraid. Now we fill, f- read that they were filled with a great fear. And they said to one another, who then is this? Who is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. That's led Kevin the Young to say, this is great. The only thing more frightening than being in a small boat in the middle of a big storm is being in a small boat with a man who shouts at big storms and the storms obey. In that moment, what happened? They caught a glimpse of the holiness and majesty of Jesus. The total, total otherness of someone that was way beyond their control. In the presence of Jesus Christ, for a moment they realized they were in the presence of the Holy One. And they trembled with fear. You see, we're going to come back to this in a moment, but their problem was not a problem of fear in itself. The disciples' great problem was a problem of misplaced fear. They thought the storm was the most powerful and most threatening thing in that moment. But when Jesus demonstrated that he had power over the storm, they caught a glimpse of the holiness of Jesus and they were led there for a moment and they were terrified. We thought the storm was powerful. If he's more powerful than the storm, what could he do to us? So that's the text. That's the account that Mark gives to us. And now for the second half of this message, I just want to step back for a moment, boil it down and ask, what do we learn from this? And as I ordered the walk through the narrative under those three headings, the great storm, the great calm, the great fear, we're going to have three lessons that I think we're to draw from this account. Lesson number one, this Jesus is not just a man. This is God in the flesh. This is the Son of God. That is the first thing for sure we are to draw from this narrative. That question the disciples ask, who then is this, is left hanging in the air, and every one of us has to answer it for ourselves. And we can conclude that this Jesus is not just a man, because in this action of stilling the storm, Jesus does something that only God can do. Jesus' original hearers certainly would not have missed this fact. See, in the Hebrew worldview, water could represent life in some contexts, the giving of life, but more often than not, it represents death and chaos. All through the Old Testament, you see this. Water speaks of judgment, death, chaotic forces that are beyond our control. A biblical theology on water would be a fascinating study. Someone's probably already done it. If they haven't, there's perhaps a good idea for a master's or a PhD going forward. Just think of it for a moment. Genesis 1-2. You read, just before God exerts his creative power and sovereignty over creation, making everything, you read, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And what you're to see is there's this picture of the waters. It represents this chaos, formlessness, emptiness. There's nothing. It's all out of control. And God's Spirit is about to act upon that chaos and to bring order and calm. Think of Noah in Genesis 6. Water there represents judgment and death. Something similar in Exodus, 
when the waters of the Red Sea block the Israelites. The Egyptians are coming in behind them, and there's a wall of death in the wall of water in front of them. But what does God do? He exerts his power over the water and opens it up, and his people walk through safely on dry land. They're delivered through the, 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 the waters, and then the waters close in and become waters of judgment on Pharaoh and the Egyptians. In the Psalms, over and over again, poetically, water represents chaos, that which can take your life. And the only one continually and consistently who can exert power over the chaos of deathly water is Yahweh, God himself, the God of the Old Testament. So in Psalm 107, verses 28 and 30, you read this beautiful poetic picture of people who are in deep trouble in a storm in the sea. And here's what you read in verses 28 to 30 of Psalm 107. They cried to the Lord, to Yahweh, in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. See, these disciples, they knew. Some of them would have known their Old Testament well. They would have known that only God can exert control over the waters and over the seas. In the Psalms, it's God who stills the storm and the seas. And so when Jesus rose and he said to those waters that threatened death, peace be still, Every single one of those disciples in that moment knew he's just done something that only God can do. And so as they try to put it all together in their heads, they ask, who then is this? Now you can imagine their question, who is this? They just seen Jesus the man asleep. And what do we read of elsewhere in Psalms? Like Psalm 121, for example. God never slumbers or sleeps. Jesus, the man, they just saw him sleeping. But then they saw him rising up and exerting the same power that God exerted in creation when he spoke everything into existence. And so the disciples are looking at this and saying, this is a man, he's asleep. But this is God. And how do we put all this together? But we see that this is indeed God come down in human flesh. This is God incarnate. This is Jesus Christ. The God-man in him are united two natures in one spectacular person. The divine nature and the human nature meet in one personal union. One person, two natures. One fully divine, one fully human. This passage gives us such a beautiful glimpse into the two natures of Jesus Christ, a truth that has been proclaimed and defended by the church down through the years, codified and articulated in confessions like the Nicene Creed and the Creed of Chalcedon of 451 AD. Think about it, back in 351, they were writing about these two natures of Jesus, codifying what the apostles taught because they didn't want people to drift away from it in one way or the other. Here is theological orthodoxy. You've got to believe this if you're going to be a Christian. Jesus is fully God and fully man. We see it here so beautifully. As a man, he sleeps because he's tired. As God, he sleeps the sea. It's glorious, spectacular. Now, remember how Mark began this gospel. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We said in that first sermon that we're going to see account after account, not so much the teaching of Jesus, but Mark gives us more actions. See the actions of Jesus, because Mark wants us to be convinced that Jesus is who Mark has said he is. He really is the Son of God, the divine Son of God. And so you're to see his actions, and you step back and go, who then is this? Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So who do you say Jesus is this morning? How do you answer that question? Who then is this? 
Because we're going to see, as we continue through that gospel, that is the fundamental question. That's right at the middle of the book when Jesus asks Simon Peter, who do people say I am? Actually, Peter, not so much who do people say, who do you say I am? And Jesus would ask that question of every single one of us, who do you say I am? For this is where your entrance into the kingdom of God, where becoming a Christian begins. The identity of Jesus Christ. Who do you say Jesus is? Is this all lies? Was he deluded? Or is he Lord of all? We've all got to decide. So the first lesson we're to learn from this incredible account in Jesus' life is that this Jesus is not just a man. This is the God man. This is the Son of God. Second lesson. If Jesus is in our boat, we don't have to fear what everyone else fears. Now this brings us to the question Jesus asked his disciples in the midst of the great calm in verse 40. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Now what is Jesus saying in that moment? Jesus' question assumes if they did have faith in who he was and is, they wouldn't be afraid. If they really got, we have God in the boat, they wouldn't have been as afraid. They wouldn't have been afraid at all. Now, this is a battle. Passages like this are in the Bible because God knows we all struggle with fear. And I don't think any Christian just arrives one day, boom, that's me, 100% sanctified when it comes to my battle with fear. No, I know some of you struggle greatly with fear and anxiety. We all do from time to time. Times. There's always things that can make us afraid. So this is here to help us fight fear. Jesus says, if you really got it, if you really understood who I am, if you really knew who was with you in the middle of this storm, if you would embrace who I am by faith, the one who's with you, the one who will never leave you, you wouldn't be so given to fear. Let's try to receive this truth by faith this morning, but I know it's so hard. When you get struck with news about sickness or cancer or one of your loved ones, boy, we don't all just suddenly feel serene and calm. So this is here for us. If Jesus is in the boat with you, you don't have to fear what's around the boat because Jesus is more powerful than everything outside the boat. And let's apply this to ourselves now in this pandemic of fear we're living through. Yes, there is a virus out there that can lead to a small proportion of the population's death. This pandemic has confronted us all with our mortality. It seems to attack at random it's confronted us all as humans and all in our culture with the fact that we're not invincible. We're not in control. This being confronted with our fragility and our mortality has struck fear into the heart of our culture. There's something that can take our lives. And what does our culture try to do? What, do, what does this world try to do? Let's paste over the fact that we're all going to die. Let's deny it. Let's deny it. Let's deny it. Let's paste over it. Let's domesticate it. Let's never even think about it. Of course, the virus, we can get on top of it. We can control it. We can fight it. But ultimately, what's the best that the scientists can do? Merely prolong life a little longer. So what's the solution when you're confronted with your mortality and the reality of death? Let's autonomously do everything we can in our strength to just eke out a little bit more life for everyone. And I want to say, is that it? Is that the best, our responses to the fragility and reality of our death? 
fearfully to panic like the disciples and run around frantically. Let's do anything we can to prolong life, prolong life. Let's deny our mortality again as if it's not real. All the efforts of everyone, no matter how great they've been, and we appreciate greatly the efforts of our government and doctors and nurses and scientists. Of course, we appreciate it all. But let's remember as Christians that all of those interventions, all they can do is give us some extra time. Because I don't know about you, but I'm yet to hear of a cure for death. So far as I understand, What's the death rate for humanity? 100%. If COVID doesn't get you now, I'm sorry to tell you this, but if COVID doesn't get you now, something eventually will. And it's as if that's not reality in our culture at the moment. It's as if everyone's just denying death because we're so afraid of it. We're afraid of the great unknown. We're afraid of our mortality. We're afraid of death. But here is where we have the most amazing and incredible truth for our culture. We have in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, one who has taken on that which no human man or woman can take on. Something we can't beat, like the disciples couldn't beat the storm, we can't beat death. But we have one who has taken on death and won. One who went through death and holds the keys of death and now makes it into a doorway that leads us to a better life. This is absolutely amazing. We have one in Jesus Christ who doesn't just buy us extra time, he buys us eternal life. That's amazing. And don't our culture need to hear that? We have one who has taken the source of all our problems. He's taken on himself all our sickness, all our disease. We have one who was infected with our sin so that he could save us and cure us from it all. He took on himself the disease of our sin. And he died and paid our debt. And he took it into the grave and he left it there. And he rose again, and now he says, you can live in me. I give you new life. You'll be born again. No infection, no sin, none of that. I give you life, life, and the life Jesus gives will never die. No one can touch it. No virus can get it. Nothing can touch the life that Jesus gives you. That's why Jesus said at the tomb of Lazarus, the one who believes in me, though we die, Yet will he live. Jesus has beaten death. That's the news that everyone needs to hear. He's beaten it. You see that thing that none of us, that that, that we're all afraid of out there? You see that thing that we're all panicking like the disciples in the boat? Don't you care, God? Jesus has shown in his actions he cares. With Jesus in the boat, you don't have to fear what everyone else fears. With Jesus in the boat, we have one who will, as the captain of our salvation, guide us safely to the harbor of rest. And knowing this truth doesn't just apply to the fear of death. Some of you may still struggle with the fear of what's ahead for you. But some of you might say, no, death, I'm not too worried about it. Because I do, I believe, I receive all that, I believe it. But maybe you have other fears. Maybe it is that long COVID or fear of suffering on the way to death or fear of an unknown future or fear of being single for your whole life or fear for your kids' well-being, fear of a difficult person at work. Let me say again, if Jesus is with us in the boat, 
in the middle of all that storm around, the storm around us that makes us afraid, if Jesus is with us in the boat, we don't have to be so afraid. I think it's really important to caveat this. Some of you might be screaming that. The more logical people might be saying, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. So what, do we not even bother with seatbelts? Do we not take any medicine? Of course I'm not saying that. Clifford uh, mentioned just before the service, it, it's great because God's actually the one that invented seatbelts. <laughs> no, we're given so much to help us in this world and in this life. I put on my seatbelt. I lock the doors. I take vaccines, and I'm very happy to, that help us, of course. But ultimately, ultimately, our hope is not in the seatbelt or the door lock or the vaccine. Ultimately, our hope is far greater than that. So do not live just like all those others who are terrified of death. Do not give in to the narrative of fear. Choose faith, not fear. Well, the third lesson that I just want to close on is this. I hinted at this earlier. The disciples' greatest problem was not the fear in itself. Theirs was the problem of misplaced fear. And that's the title I've given this message, The Problem of Misplaced Fear. Think about it with me. In verse 40, we read that the disciples were afraid of the storm. When the storm's taken away, you would think, okay, that which was causing them to be afraid has now been removed. Therefore, there should be no more fear. And yet, at the end of the narrative, we read, they were filled with great fear. And I mentioned earlier that this was because they acknowledged and realized in that moment something about the holiness of Jesus. He is sovereign over every storm. You see, they caught a glimpse of Jesus, we could say, just as he was. They saw his holiness and it left them trembling. Do you remember that moment in the Gospels where Simon Peter's fishing? He hasn't caught anything. Jesus said, let down your nets on the other side. He catches them all. And you'd think in that moment he'd be rejoicing. But what does he say? Depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. Another glimpse of the holiness of Jesus that convicted him of his sin and caused his heart to fear rightly Jesus. When we are afraid of things in this life, our problem is not just a problem of fear in itself. Ours is a problem of misplaced fear. We fear the thing that's under Jesus' control. We fear it more than we fear Jesus. In Isaiah 8, 12, when the Israelites were fearful at a time of national crisis, possible invasion, God sent a prophet to say, do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread, but the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy, let him be your fear. In Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. How are we different as Christians from everyone else in our culture who does not own the name of Christ at the moment? We don't misplace fear. We know who we should fear, and that is God. Because COVID may take our life in this world, But what's most important is that you are right with the one who can send you to hell after this world. And I don't say that because I'm a Turner Burn preacher. I believe that's true. 
And I believe that millions of people are deluded into this narrative that we can control this, we've got this, we've got this, when all that's being done is the pushing back of death a little further. I want someone who can deal with death. And that's what we have as Christians. And that should make each of our hearts sing. But it should also make us desirous to speak. Because this is a message of life or death that right now the nations need to hear. So in these days where fear is soaked in all around us, let's make sure our fear is channeled in the right direction. Let's begin with God. Lord, I want to fear you. I want to fear you. Now that means right reverence, right respect, right honor. That's not just terrified, terrified. That's bowing humbly and acknowledging the holy sovereign power of God. He's your maker. He's your Lord. That's where we begin. And then we confront every other fear from the place of rightly placed fear. We don't fear death, or at least we fight continually any residing fear of death. We don't have to fear it because we know the one who holds the key of it. I love that as we go through that shadowy valley of uncertainty, whatever death is like, that moment where you pass through those poetic waters of Jordan. When you go through the waters of death, isn't it wonderful to know the words of Psalm 23? Though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to fear evil. For thou art with me. God will stay with us through life. He'll hold our hand and he won't let go for a moment through that transition into death. He'll take us through. I love that. He'll never get out of our boat to leave us. He says, fear not, for I'm with you. Here's what makes the difference for us as Christians in the pandemic. We can say, God is with us in this. He's more powerful than the virus. He's sovereign over it all, and he's with us. And so though there are things out there that can cause my heart to tremble, I will battle them with this truth. God is with me. I don't have to be afraid. With Jesus with me in the boat, I don't have to be afraid because he's with me. I am so, so glad that I have Jesus in the boat of my life. So, so thankful. Can you take, and do you have that assurance yourself today? Oh, I have Jesus in the boat. That is the most important thing. That is the most important thing truth for you to be able to state this morning. I have Jesus in the boat. I have Jesus in my life. Receive him this morning. The cure that is greater than anything else. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for this incredible portrait of the holiness of your son in Mark's gospel. We are to see who Jesus is, the Lord, the Son of God. And we are to see the difference he makes. Here is one who comes alongside us in our fears and says, I will help you with this. Do not fear. Why are you so afraid? O oh Lord, by faith, we receive again, Jesus, and ask that you would help us with all the things that make us afraid. And I pray that this week, you'd help us and give us opportunities to tell other people that we have one who has dealt with our greatest problem, death itself, and we don't have to be afraid of it. Lord, of course, we're called to be wise and give us wisdom. But Lord, let us never give in to fear so that we can shine brightly for you with wisdom, with care, with humility in the middle of this situation you've placed us in. Thank you, Lord, that you've promised never to leave us and never forsake us. We thank you 
that we will not go through death alone. And when all our earthly friends fade away, we have one who'll stick closer than a brother and who'll walk with us safely to the place prepared for us. Oh, we thank you that we do not have to fear death. We rejoice in the one who said, in this world you'll have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to respond by standing together to sing of this lovely hope that burns within our hearts. Let's stand together. we thank you for the hope of joy unspeakable in our home with you. And now, Lord, may your grace, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Please do take your seats uh, and remember as you're exiting uh, the church, just uh, be mindful of what